COVID-19 has changed our world. The way we live, our economy, our health systems, everything. COVID-19 will not be forgotten. To make sure that we never go through this again, we have to understand why it happened. COVID-19 and other zoonotic outbreaks were transmitted to people from wild animals that were taken from or pushed out of their natural environment. Some transmitted the virus directly to people, while others transmitted it through domesticated animals, including livestock. This is not the first time. SIV jumped from a primate to a human and then became HIV. SARS jumped from a civet being sold on a menu. Mares from a camel. Bird flu jumped from wild birds. Ebola from bats. There are countless other viruses in nature waiting to be unleashed if we don't change our relationship with nature. Experts agree. Rising commercial wildlife trade, industrial farming, and dwindling wilderness have brought people into closer, unnatural contact with wild animals. ASEAN member states can safeguard against future pandemics by addressing these root causes, by resourcing the protection of wildlife populations inside their natural environments, by supporting demand reduction campaigns, by introducing strong laws against wildlife poaching and trafficking, by resourcing the enforcement of those laws. A new medical cure for COVID-19 will not work against the next virus. Stimulus packages will amount to expensive band-aids that need frequent changing if we do not address the root causes. Let's bring ASEAN society together to prevent more outbreaks through nature protection, as if our lives and economy depend on it. Distinguished parliamentarians, uh, dear colleagues and friends, good morning, good afternoon, good uh, evening to everyone, depending on where you are now. Uh, my name is Nguyen Tung, one Secretary General of the ASEAN Interparliamentary Assembly, IPA. Uh, first of all, I have a great pleasure to extend to you my warmest greetings and welcome you all to the virtual briefing jointly organized by IPA and ICCF on the origin of COVID-19, wildlife threat, and preventing future pandemics. Uh, so I'll, now I would like to uh, ask the uh, technical team of the ICCF to show the video clip and I will continue my um, uh, introductions and upcoming remarks this morning. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I think uh, now you yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm, oh, okay. Um, so um, I just want to say briefly a little bit about uh, IPA and ICCF because I think that there are also many participants in audience who want to know about these organizations. So um, uh, IPA consists of member parliament from 10 countries in Southeast Asia. And IPA aims to uh, encourage you know, understanding, cooperation, and close relation among member parliaments, as well as observer country and other parliamentary organizations. IPA also play a very important role in familiarizing the people of Southeast Asia with policies uh, aimed at promoting ASEAN growth uh, based on the three pillars of the ASEAN integration process. Uh, the ICCF support the International Conservation Caucus, uh, the largest bipartisan caucus in the United States Congress. 
uh, the ICC focus on uh, creating policy that balance the need of economy, uh, national security, and development with the uh, responsible use of natural resources. Uh, the ICCF advanced leadership uh, in international conservation by raising conservation awareness among policymakers and uh, specifically addresses the relevant issues of wildlife trafficking, forestry, illegal fishing, and marine debris. Um, we, are all very, we are very honored today to jointly host this webinar with ICCF on the biggest issues of our time. Uh, zoonotic disease is not a new phenomenon as we already um, experienced uh, that disease, uh, that kind of disease um, such as uh, SARS, Ebola, and HIV. However, this COVID-19 pandemic really has a global devastating impact on uh, and changed our life uh, in all aspects and in the ways that we have never experienced. That is why I think that we have to collaborate effort to find solutions for that. Um, dear parliamentarians, uh, first of all, I would like to um, thank um, uh, all parliamentarians of IPA member parliaments uh, joining the webinar today. Uh, I wish to warmly uh, welcome our distinguished uh, parliamentarians from a number of countries in Southeast Asia, uh, from the Legislative Council of Brunei, uh, from Parliament of Indonesia, uh, from um, National Assembly of Laos, from Parliament of Malaysia, Parliament of Myanmar, um, both Senate and House of Representatives uh, of the Thailand. Um, representative from the Philippines and also member of the National Assembly uh, uh, of Vietnam. So I also would like to recognize our four panelists in the orders of their presentation today. Um, we warmly welcome Mr. David uh, Sperman, the author of many books, including uh, the book, Spillover Animal Infections and the Next Human Pandemic. Uh, Mr. Stephen Gans, the International Chair, founder of the Freeland Foundation. Mr. Sally Yang, a legal expert, director of the Governments Freeland Foundation. And Mr. John Scullin, a former Secretary General of CITI. I also would like to thank all the participants and audience from IPA Observer Parliament, Diplomatic Corps, National Secretariat of IPA Member Parliaments, IPA Secretariats, ICCF, uh, International Organization, and many NGO partners, and everyone for joining us uh, live stream on YouTube. Now, I um, just want to give you uh, um, the overview of today's proceeding. I, as Secretariat, will help moderating this webinar in the technical role. However, the discussion uh, will be driven by the chair, uh, parliamentarians of IPA member parliaments, and our four um, expert panelists. In a moment, I will invite Honorable Winter Nang from Vietnam National Assembly to deliver opening remarks. I will then invite each of the panelists to give 10 minute uh, presentation. After that, the chair will moderate the Q&A session, which give all the um, member of the parliament in the region the opportunity to speak to questions and panelists to answer. To conclude the webinar, I will return to the chair of the meeting to um, give some conclusion and closing remarks. Um, so dear parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, now I have a pleasure to invite Honorable Nguyen Tô Nang, um, standing member of the Science, Technology and Environment Committee of the Vietnam National Assembly to be the chair. And I also want to share with you that Mr. Nguyen Tô Nang um, spent many years teaching and doing research on agriculture, environment conservation. And he's the author of a number of scientific study on soil, plant conservation, and environment and, uh, management as well as technology in agricultural field. So now I would like to turn over to the Honorable Nguyen Tô Nang. Floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Se Secretary General, for your introductions. Uh, distinguished parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning from Vietnam. It is my uh, great honor to chair the first virtual meeting of IPA on wildlife trade the uh, origin of COVID-19 and preventing future pandemics. Uh, I would firstly like to extend my warmest greetings to the parliamentarians, international panelists, participants, and audience for joining in our webinar today. I would 
uh, especially like to thank IPA Secretariat and ICCF for your effort in organizing this event. It is also my honor to have my colleagues, uh, Honorable Mr. Don Tun Fong, a standing member of uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, to join the meeting today. Uh, colleagues and friends, uh, as you know, the coronavirus disease, uh, COVID-19, has caused a worldwide health pandemic. The World Health Organization has uh, determined that the COVID-19 is a genetic disease. Uh, which means it's originated from uh, animals and passed to humans. However, many people have uh, not been noticed about the origin of pandemics or links between wildlife and the disease. Therefore, the webinar like this would help enhance our awareness uh, of this issue. The presentation by the international and regional experts are expected to provide helpful information for parliamentarians like ourselves. It is a wake up call to take a global approach to protecting natural resources and health of billions of people. The uh, transmission of genetic disease has wide reaching negative consequences. In addition, a major global health impact, COVID-19 has led to global economic decline and threaten regional and international security. I deeply share with you uh, the concern over the damage caused by COVID-19 pandemic uh, in the entire world, especially in Asian region. Uh, since the beginning of the crisis, the solution have been deployed to manage the pandemic and its far-reaching impact and to prevent similar outbreaks in the future. Among the first solution, tackling wildlife <coughs> trafficking is also key to prevent a future pandemic. A large volume of trade and wild animal created high risk for vital disease. Wildlife trafficking is conducted domestically and internationally for profit. Now, without responsible consideration of epidemic risks and ecological damage, the consequent massive economic and social cost to the world. In the wildlife trafficking chain, the Asian region has been mainly targeted as a transit or destination countries, especially in the areas such as the Great Mekong Golden Triangle, where Laos, PDR, Thailand, Malaysia, and Myanmar meet too close to Chinese border. Uh, ending trade uh, in high risk, wildlife and reducing wildlife consumption are urgent action that we need to take to reduce wildlife borne disease risks to humans. Global collective effort is underway across the governments, the United Nations, international and national organizations, uh, the private sector, local communities, and others to combat wildlife trade. Since 1975, scientists known as the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora has aimed to ensure that the international trade in wild animal and plants does not threaten their survival. In the Asian region, many government efforts was taken to respond to the wildlife trafficking such as the creation of Asian Wildlife Enforcement Network called Asian One in 2005, and the approval of the solution by Asian Interparliamentary Assembly, IPA General Assembly in 2012 and 2015, to strengthen law enforcement and regional cooperation to combat wildlife crime. The recent Asian summit also issued to a uh, declaration uh, on COVID-19, which is currently adopted by Asian member. Illegal wildlife trade has linked with serious transaction uh, crime that need international cooperation and continued support from the government and parliament around the world. From the policy perspective, wildlife trade ban is a tool to decrease contact between wild animal and people, 
which was proven as a most practical and a cost effective approach to reducing global human health threaten posed by genetic disease. The trade ban alone are unlikely to be effective. Uh, it must be associated with human behavior change and improving reg regular efforts to improve uh, worldwide uh, surveillance. Robust action requires concerted commitment from policymakers, conventionists, scientists, and health experts. Ladies and gentlemen, with the view to increase the better awareness of and understanding of IPA member parliaments, as well as the national secretariat and public in the fight against this devastating pandemic and preventing similar infectious disease in the future. I hope the webinar today is a forum where the parliamentarians, environmental, convention and legal experts will share their view and exchange experience as well as best practices in wildlife legislation in the region. I look forward to informative webinar and lively uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Honorable Nguyen Tuấn Anh, uh, distinguished uh, parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen. Um, now we will hear the uh, presentation from our four expert uh, panelists. Um, the first oral uh, testimony by world expert, uh, Mr. David Kwaman. Uh, Mr. David Kwaman is the author of uh, many books, including uh, the um, 2012 books, Spillover, Animal Infections, and uh, the Next uh, Human Pandemic. And uh, this book uh, received two awards, uh, namely the Science and Science Book Award given by the National As Association of Science uh, Writer and uh, the Science Biology Book Award in General Biology. So I have a privilege uh, to um, turn over now to Mr. David Kamen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary General. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, honorable members, for this invitation to talk with you this morning. Um, for the sake of conciseness and to sort of uh, set the scene, I'll put my remarks in the form of a series of questions, questions that have occurred to a lot of people, which I will try to answer as best I can uh, one by one. These are some of the basics, but hoping to get us all on the same page. First of all, why do pandemics happen? They happen generally because a dangerous new pathogen, um, and most often nowadays that pathogen is a virus, a dangerous new pathogen causes an unfamiliar disease to break out among humans in a single location, and that outbreak fails to be contained. If there's bad luck, if the disease proves easily transmissible among humans, if it escapes beyond containment in the outbreak location, it can spread quick, quickly around the world by international airline travel. Where do dangerous new viruses come from? New viruses come to humans from wild animals. That's why we call them um, zoonoses and why we call these diseases zoonotic diseases. Now, there's a universe of viruses dwelling out in our great diverse ecosystems. That's, that's just a fact of nature. Every virus exists as a parasite within some other kind of living creature. It exists in a species of animal, in a plant, in a fungus, in a bacterium. And some of those that are within animals have the capacity to take hold in humans and spread murderously. In fact, they, they help remind us that we are humans. We are mammals, closely enough related to other mammals to share some of their viral infections. Recent examples of uh, new viruses that have spilled over into humans from wild animals, Machupo virus in Bolivia, 1961, causing Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, Marburg virus, 1967, coming with monkeys shipped from Uganda to Marburg, Germany for medical purposes, the Ebola, 1976, um, emerging for the first time in Sudan and DR Congo. 
uh, HIV recognized in 1981, Hendra virus in Australia in 1994, Nipah virus coming out of bats through pigs into people in 1998, Northern Malaysia, SARS, of course, the original SARS, 2002, 2003, coming out of Southern China, MERS from the Arabian Peninsula in 2012, all of those zoonotic viruses causing zoonotic diseases. Now, which kinds of new virus are most likely to cause a pandemic? Well, the influenza viruses and the coronaviruses have been at the top of the watch list among disease scientists, at least, for decades. Why? Because they transmit as respiratory infections. They have the capacity to evolve quickly and adapt to new hosts, such as humans. And because they have a demonstrated record, these viruses, these groups of viruses, of causing pandemics or dangerous outbreaks in the past. In the case of influenza viruses, the record is long. You can go back to the 1918 influenza, which killed probably 50 million people and another, a number of other influenza pandemics over the years, 1957, 1968 pandemic influenza. In the case of coronaviruses, we had the warning events of the original SARS, 2002, 2003, and MERS in 2012 in the Arabian Peninsula, and then in 2015, an outbreak in the Republic of Korea. Some countries, notably the Republic of Korea, Singapore, a few others, as well as Hong Kong, were affected enough by those outbreaks of coronaviruses and wise enough to learn vigilance against the next coronavirus. And some countries such as my own were not wise enough. Which animals are most likely to pass their viruses to humans? Based on past experience, it's primates, including both apes and monkeys, rodents, which are very diverse, and bats, also a very diverse group of mammals carrying a lot of viruses. It's also possible for a virus to pass from its natural host into another animal, an intermediate host and from that animal into humans. Now, where and how did this new coronavirus originate? Well, there are lots of stories. There are rumors flying around, but there is evidence also. There's molecular evidence, good solid molecular evidence from sequencing of viral genomes and comparing those genomes. And that evidence shows that the ancestral strain of this virus came from bats, horseshoe bats, a particular group of bats, um, a group of a sort that roost in caves in central and southern China. But that ancestral virus may have spilled over into another animal, another species of animal, and evolved in that other kind of animal for as long as 40 or 50 years before spilling more recently into humans. Uh, the molecular evidence, again, suggests that. Was that other animal a pangolin? There's been some talk about that. Or was it another form of bat? Um, the evidence so far is inconclusive on that. And the fact that the evidence in is inconclusive reflects the fact that we badly need more research on coronaviruses in their animal hosts. Why is it important to answer the question of where this virus came from? It's important because that answer may help scientists create vaccines and treatments for this virus, and because it'll certainly help us avoid the next coronavirus pandemic. What circumstances contribute to the spillover of new viruses like this that may cause human pandemics? The capture or killing of wild animals for food and transport of wild animals, alive or dead, for sale privately or in markets. Those actions give animal viruses the opportunity to spill into humans. Also, the disruption of wild, diverse ecosystems generally, um, the, the cutting of trees, the building of timber camps, the building of mining camps, um, all of those disruptive activities in our wild diverse ecosystems, again, bring humans into contact with wild animals. And therefore, just the destruction of ecosystems is a broad contributing factor. And I'm sure John Scanlon will talk more about that. If a virus makes this leap into humans and it can transmit from one human to another, it has opened the door to great evolutionary success in the Darwinian sense, proliferating and expanding its existence 
through geographical space and time around the world. But if human wisdom and science and preparedness are well mounted against viral adaptiveness and proliferation, then we can succeed next time and not the virus. And I'll end my comments there for now and be happy to answer questions. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. David Kwaman, uh, for sharing us uh, the information about your book, Spillover. And I'm sure that during Q and A session, parliamentarians will ask um, your questions and you have a chance to to talk with them. Uh, so now uh, our uh, our second panelist um, is uh, from Mr. Stephen Gunster. Uh, Stephen Gunster is the uh, founder of the Freeland Foundation. And um, he designed and um, managed investigation uh, remaining program that link government and civil society effort to counter uh, wildlife, uh, human trafficking, associated transnational organized crime and corruption. And his reports uh, have featured on CNN, BBC, uh, Time, uh, National Geographic, Discovery, uh, and uh, New York Times. And he is also the co creator of the five organizations. YH, Wildlife Alliance, Phonic, Ascendwen, and Freeland. Now I'd like to give the opportunity to uh, Mr. Stephen Gaster uh, to uh, speak with us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary General. Uh, I just need somebody to enable my screen sharing, please. Uh, while they're working on that, I just wanted to say thank you again, Madam Secretary General, for inviting us today and ICCF as well. Uh, Freeland operates a, a data fusion center called ASSET. It stands for the Analytical Center of Excellence on Trafficking. Uh, we re recently uh, released a study based on 20 years of uh, research into Southeast Asia's wildlife trade, both legal and illegal. I led this project. So what I'm gonna to do today is just summarize our findings. Uh, and the full report uh, is available with much more detail in different languages, including ASEAN languages. Uh, and that's what I want to show here. And I'm still unable to share my screen. Yes. Okay. Give me one second here. All right. Okay. Everybody see my screen? Okay, great. Yeah. So I will summarize our findings here very briefly. Uh, basically, the wildlife trade in Southeast Asia poses very serious threats to not only the region's wildlife, but also to its economy, its governance, and its environment. And the potential for more zoonotic outbreaks right in this region is, is real. You know, the focus of COVID-19 has very much been on sort of wildlife trade and markets in China. Also, as uh, David Quammen just said, on, on bats and pangolins. But uh, make no mistake about it, um, this threat goes beyond China and it goes beyond these particular animals. We see some of the same species that ended up in you know, markets in say Wuhan or <clears throat> Guangdong where the SARS outbreak took place before. Uh, the same species are up, uh, appearing in, in markets and moving through supply chains uh, through Southeast Asia on a daily basis. And that's because the si supply chains are, are, are linked. And before I go on, um, I'm an American, and I just want to make sure people don't think I'm, I'm bashing on Southeast Asia here. Uh, the United States is the second biggest importer of wildlife in the world. And I'm very glad to see that you know, uh, American uh, government officials, particularly congressmen uh, and civil society are campaigning to see reform in the United States as well. So I just wanted to say that before I go on. But the focus of today's talk is really on ASEAN. So I'll go back to this region, <clears throat> but um, some of the same animals are appearing in markets throughout the region, 
uh, some of these photos are, are quite recent. And no one country, almost no one country in the region is really uh, bereft of this. So we've got uh, you know, Indonesia, we've got penguins still appearing in Laos and Vietnam, uh, different species up in a couple different markets up in northern Myanmar along the border. Uh, we've got live you know, bread and wild animals for sale in downtown Bangkok. Um, Singapore, which may not have big markets, still has some wet markets selling certain kinds of species, but also it's a big transit. This picture shows the remains of 18,000 dead pangolins. These are scales that are being shipped to a market transiting the country. And I hang on to here a moment because across the region, perhaps five to 8% of wildlife shipments actually get detected. So imagine uh, how much is really getting through. Vietnam, transit and consumer country. Those are frozen pangolins there, the officers handling them. Uh, and we see mixed cargo crossing Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam, Laos. Here's a picture of leopards, tigers, and pangolins. They're all in the back of one truck moving across the Mekong River. Now, the supplies of these animals is going low in the region because the trade is so big. And so the syndicates that are behind it have really you know, started to source their, uh, their, their product, if you will, in Africa. Penguins, for example, many of those scales are now coming from, from Africa, but it's not just penguins. Uh, and these are the supply chains very roughly described coming in from Africa, east, west, and southern into Southeast Asia onto various different markets. We've got lions for the lion bone trade. A lot of people might not know that you can get sick from eating or handling a, a big cat in a certain way. They can pass on uh, TB. Uh, rhino poaching is still a problem, especially in uh, South Africa, which has relatively the biggest population, but driven by trade over in this region for, for rhino horn, which we see some of the horns being seized at the airports. Again, we don't know how much is getting through Elephants are still being uh, hammered for the ivory trade. One elephant every 30, perhaps 45 minutes being poached for their tusks. Enforcement is definitely up in Southeast Asia on this, but some tusks are still getting through. And still in this region, we see awful lot of turtles, tortoises, and snakes being uh, grabbed from the wild, moved through the same supply chains, being sold in Southeast Asia, but also being moved to other parts of the world including China, but also as pets, uh, which are delivered through the region and out to Europe, United States, and other places on personal cargo. That's an x-ray shot of some small uh, turtles uh, being smuggled in a suitcase. And then we've got other exotic pets. For example, this one shot here of baby bears and a, a primate were on their way to the Middle East from Southeast Asia. And finally, we've got a, a burgeoning trade on online, all kinds of platforms selling, you know, legally and illegally. Now, who's behind this trade? Well, it's, it's organized crime. And that would take a whole other presentation to show you the businesses and the people that's sensitive information. But um, suffice to say, the law enforcement agencies in this region know who the companies and people are. They just haven't had the backing to go after and dismantle these criminal syndicates. But they are winning. Uh, traffickers are definitely winning on the enforcement front. The problem is that from what we've seen is that the legal trade in wildlife is masking the illegal trade. The illegal trade is about 10 times bigger than the legal trade, but it can't operate without wildlife breeding farms and the presence of legal wildlife markets, whether they're in Jakarta, Bangkok, or, or, or wherever. Those mask it, and they also can mask viruses. The virus does not discriminate against a legal or illegal animal. So how do we stop this? Well, first of all, these uh, supply chains, again, run by cross-border criminal networks, for the most part. Uh, to, to fight them, we have to have cross-border uh, law enforcement networks, and not just including um, environmental and wildlife agencies to, to fight them. These criminal networks are laundering money, 
they are committing crimes across border. So we need the appropriate agencies to come and join the environmental agencies like uh, anti-corruption units. These criminal networks are uh, corrupting enforcement chains. Uh, we need prosecutors, financial intelligence units to go after the money, et cetera. When this has happened before, when the different countries have come together with their enforcement agencies to join the environmental agencies, it has worked. This is a picture of China, African agencies, South Asia and Southeast Asia meeting and doing a joint cross-border enforcement operation called Operation Cobra. Now uh, they did this several times, racked up lots of uh, successes and we saw intelligence going from Vietnam uh, to the Congo and then to Hong Kong. And as a result, they caught major criminals at each of those places and seized major uh, uh, sizes of, 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 of ivory you see there, rhino horn and, and many other things. So that kind of cooperation works when it's supported. Another example, January, 2018, based on information between countries, uh, and our organization got involved too, providing information on uh, another suspected kingpin, Boon Chai Bak, of a network called Hydra, uh, led to his arrest by Thai police. But um, as Sally will say in more detail in a moment, the laws across the region, they are better on wildlife, but a lot of them are, are still new. Some are still a little fuzzy uh, to agencies to interpret them and definitely low priority in the courts and to a lot of law enforcement agencies. For example, the suspect I just mentioned before, Boon Chai Bak, he was acquitted. There was lots of intelligence against this syndicate within the government of Thailand, but also in other countries. Those agencies and countries did not get together to share that and they could have dismantled this syndicate. I would highly recommend going back to one of our opening uh, speakers to revive and strengthen the ASEAN Wildlife Enforcement Network, which ran for 15 years. It's still in operation uh, under a, a slightly different name. It meets once a year. It does not do joint trainings, joint operations. Uh, I think it has great potential as an interagency cross-border network if we bring in those other law enforcement agencies to uh, play an equal, if not leading role in this ASEAN network. Finally, <clears throat> uh, overall, the recommendations from our side are to treat the wildlife trade, illegal or legal, as a public health and national security issue. Three specific recommendations. Uh, end the commercial trade in wild animals. Just let these animals stay in their natural homes. There's no reason why we need to push or pull them out for commercial sale. I am not talking about banning subsistence hunting. That is a completely separate issue. Poor people, folks living in and among wildlife, if they need to put meat on their table, <clears throat> there's a way for governments to, um, to deal with that and regulate it. That's a separate issue. We're talking about ending the commercial trade in wild animals. Secondly, uh, compensate or transition the legal animal dealers to other vocations. There's an awful lot of money being spent in the world right now for good reason to deal with coronavirus and the uh, after effects. A very tiny percentage of that could help uh, transition the legal dealers out. And finally, uh, authorize and support the anti-money laundering uh, organizations to uh, go after and seize assets from the illegal dealers. You know, we talk about this trade being upwards of 20, $25 billion a year. A lot of that's in Asia. Um, where's all that money? You know, the government should be take that money back and channel it into a wildlife recovery fund to help pay for all these recommendations. Um, the final thing I'd like to say is, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, well, we can't shut down the legal wildlife trade it's not necessary, we need to clean the markets. I think, uh, you know, as I said, the, the virus does not discriminate between a an animal that has a document and that doesn't have a document. Uh, there may be some difference, but at the end of the day, it's dangerous. And we also need to bear in mind the economic cost, the invoice that COVID-19 delivered to the world and continues to mount 10 trillion, it could be much more than that, and the, the price of, of closing down the trade 
versus keeping it open, I think is something that uh, policymakers need to, um, to weigh. Finally, I'd like to thank our partners, the ASEAN Interparliamentary Assembly, which we have an MOU with, uh, also our supporters and partners, WildAid and WWF Greater Mekong. We're running, also Freeland is uh, part of a campaign called endpandemics.earth. We have more information on those websites and with our partner organizations, they have more information as well. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Steve, for um, sharing with us um, about the free land, about the uh, wildlife trade, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, wildlife consumption, and especially um, I'm very impressed by the uh, some recommendation that we propose to um, our policymakers. Uh, now we um, uh, we uh, we will go to hear the uh, next uh, presentation from Ms. Uh, Sally Yang. Um, Sally Yang is a lawyer, a director of governance, a freelance foundation, and she currently leads the law and policy component of the uh, USAID Wildlife Asia program to support uh, ASEAN to counter wildlife crime. And today, Sally will talk about the regional legal and policy framework on counter wildlife trafficking in the time of COVID-19 and other pandemics. The floor is your turn. Sally, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, um, Chairman, Secretary General, Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. I shall attempt to give you a very brief overview on what is the current policy and legal framework in the ASEAN region on counter wildlife trafficking and illegal wildlife trade. ASEAN as a region has several policies to address wildlife trafficking issue. Chairman mentioned some. The ASEAN bodies including IPA, ASEAN Ministerial Meeting on Transnational Crime, the East Asia Summit, uh, and ASEAN Apol have all made resolutions or declarations to support combating wildlife trafficking. The two main ASEAN working groups on countering wildlife trafficking are the ASEAN Working Group on CITES and Wildlife Enforcement under the Economic Pillar, and SOM TC Working Group on Wildlife and Timber Trafficking under the Political and Security Pillar. In March 2019, a special ASEAN ministerial meeting on illegal wildlife trade was convened, which resulted in the Chiang Mai Ministerial Declaration on Illegal Wildlife Trade. From a zoonotic disease point of view, it is notable, not noteworthy that in 2016, ASEAN established the ASEAN Coordination Center for Animal Health and Zoonosis, recognizing the need for a unified approach to address animal health, to collaborate with human health sector, and to reduce disparity in capacity in dealing with animal health and zoonosis amongst the, um, uh, the ASEAN member states. And the very latest, as mentioned by Chairman, in April this year, uh, ASEAN made a declaration at the Special ASEAN Summit on Coronavirus Disease 2019, uh, or the COVID-19. So there you have the policy framework within ASEAN to combat wildlife crime. Now, let us look at the legal framework. All 10 ASEAN member states are parties to CITES. CITES is an international agreement between the governments and serves both as uh, both to facilitate legal, sustainable, and traceable trade, and in more recent years, to intercept illegal wildlife trade. Now, wildlife conservation and protection laws in many ASEAN member states were drafted or amended pursuant to CITES requirements. Now, this may create legislative inconsistency and conflict, as CITES does not necessarily deal with the full spectrum of law enforcement and criminality of wildlife crimes especially those involving transnational and organized wildlife crimes. The inherent conflict of interest between CITES management and law enforcement prevails. Further, CITES covers only endangered species, classified as Appendix 1, 2, 3, and that is a loophole as zoonotic diseases do not necessarily come from CITES listed species. So let us look at some of the key provisions that are relevant to counter wildlife trafficking. All ASEAN member states have provisions on hunting, trading, import, export, re-export, and possession in their wildlife laws. However, I would like to highlight a few key provisions that can make a difference in preventing another outbreak. Possession risk disease, as we can see in this COVID-19 and other outbreaks. While all 10 ASEAN member states have stipulated possession as an offense in their wildlife laws, 
it usually attracts a lower penalty than other offenses in wildlife trafficking. It is also interesting to note that offenses for processing of illegal wildlife and their parts are often missing in the wildlife laws. Consumption is another topic. Many countries are very reluctant to penalize consumers. And so um, provisions uh, penalizing consumers are, are sometimes um, absent in the wildlife laws. Instead, uh, they focus mainly on the supply chain. And this is still true for several ASEAN member states. Protected species lists. Now, this is often an understated issue in dealing with wildlife trafficking. Not all species are protected at the same level nationally and across the region. This creates hotspots for the criminal to operate. The discrepancies include varying levels of uh, protection for different species lists. Sometimes the protection does not extend to all species in a group of species, for example, the pangolins. And some are classified as suitable for captive breeding or as livestock. And then there are some that are exempted due to TCM use, uh, traditional Chinese medicine. With the reality of the pandemic, some scientific experts are calling for a special list for those uh, species with high risk of zoonotic diseases to be included. David earlier mentioned the ones with the highest carrier, rodents, bats, primates, and there are many others like birds. It will also be very useful if there is a regional scientific authority and a review mechanism for such a species assessment. Let us talk a little bit about captive breeding. Captive breeding of wildlife for consumption and other uses, and this is normally different from livestock, have often been criticized as enabling the illegal laundering of wildlife and have extremely poor welfare and hygiene standards. In the ASEAN region, the penalty for illegal breeding of protected wildlife are highly uneven and are comparatively lower than other wildlife trafficking offenses except for Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. They are good examples. Speaking of which, let us turn to the penalties. As of now, the penalties for wildlife trafficking offenses, hunting, possession, and trading, varies greatly among the ASEAN member states. It ranges from zero to 15 years imprisonment terms, and zero to US dollars, 88,000 in fines with the highest cap at US dollars, 380,000. The disparity of the penalties within the region means criminal can operate in countries that have lower penalties, thereby creating a safe haven for them. Penalties need to be strengthened and harmonized across the region to be effective. We need to start treating wildlife trafficking as a serious transnational organized crime. Combating wildlife trafficking requires multi-agency collaboration among different law enforcement agencies, cross-sector agencies, and transnational efforts. Interagency task force needs to be funded and enabled to support counter wildlife trafficking. Finally, a word about wildlife market. National wildlife laws do not usually address wildlife market. Wildlife law, enforcers, uh, wildlife law enforcers must rely on primary offenses such as illegal trading and possession under the wildlife laws and cooperation with other agencies implementing other relevant laws, for example, environmental, animal and public health agencies. In other words, there is a need to coordinate and collaborate among wildlife enforcers, animal health, public health, environmental authorities, civil societies, and businesses. I leave you with the position of ASEAN in the Chiang Mai Ministerial Declaration made last year on illegal wildlife trade. It says, we acknowledge that domestic wildlife markets need to be regulated and enforced thoroughly to prevent overexploitation and ensure that the sustainable population of endangered species. We recognize the importance of continuous capacity building for better wildlife management and enforcement. In this regard, we welcome collaboration with other partners to strengthen our efforts in tackling the illegal wildlife trade, such as establishing enforcement coordination mechanism. Closing domestic wildlife markets where they contribute to poaching and the illegal trade. If we take the One Health approach, Perhaps the next iteration of the ASEAN Ministerial Declaration 
on illegal wildlife trade in, can add to the above statement. Closing domestic wildlife markets to prevent transmission of zoonotic diseases and the next pandemic. In this region, Vietnam has already started the ball rolling in directing uh, where the Prime Minister has directed the Ministry of Agriculture to draft a directive on banning wildlife trade, uh, wildlife market. Singapore Parliament has debated and reviewed the issue about slaughtering of live animals in wet market. So we're well on the way. So in summary, what we're looking at in order to counter wildlife trafficking effectively is to strengthen laws by improving and harmonizing species lists, habitat protection, and stronger penalties on a regional basis. We need to strengthen and scale up interagency cross-sectorial efforts to combat wildlife trafficking and halt trade. Shut down wildlife market with a priority focus on those on high density urban areas. Of course, we need to ensure safeguard for communities and traders, ownership incentive for alternative livelihood and compensation. And last but not least, adopt a One Health approach. That's the only way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. Um, your presentation is quite interesting and uh, uh, useful. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you and your uh, parliamentarian will uh, address you with some uh, other questions. And I also want to share with you that uh, Sally is the author of the, some book, including uh, publication of the ASEAN Handbook on Legal Cooperation to Combat Wildlife Crime with partner. So thank you, Sally, for that. Um, now, uh, our last um, uh, panelist uh, is um, from Mr. John Scallon. Uh, John Scallon served as the uh, Secretary General of the CITES from 2010 to 2018 and during which uh, he led the global push to uh, increase effort to combat the wildlife, um, illegal wildlife. All right, would you like me to proceed? Great, thank you very much, uh, Madam Secretary General, and thank you also to the chair uh, for convening this uh, conservation caucus. And thanks also to our good colleagues at the ICCF for facilitating this virtual hearing. Uh, apologies for my appearance and my voice. Uh, it's close to 4 a.m. here in Switzerland. The COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us in a devastating way of the interconnected nature of things, most particularly between economies, the environment, human and wildlife health and welfare. However, our international laws, programs and funds do not yet reflect this reality, which is also largely the case at the national level. The most likely explanation for COVID-19 is that the virus jumped from bats to humans, perhaps via another animal such as a pangolin at a wet market in Wuhan. And while no firm conclusions can yet be drawn, the links between wildlife and previous epidemics and pandemics are well known as are the conditions that make spillover from animals to humans more likely. And you've just heard from David uh, on these issues. The risks are real and the stakes are high. Risk to public health through wildlife related zoonotic diseases can come from unregulated, regulated and illegal wildlife trade. And we need to draw on relevant experts to identify the wildlife markets, trade and consumption that poses a health risk so that we can focus our efforts where they are needed most and avoid any unintended consequences. <clears throat> the current international regime for regulating wildlife trade and combating wildlife crime is inadequate, both for regulating the wildlife trade markets and consumption that pose a risk to public health, as well as for ending wildlife crime. Left as it is, our system is not going to prevent the next pandemic. It could, in fact, be raising our potential exposure to zoonotic diseases that can spill over from wild animals to people. These are challenging global interconnected issues and profound changes are needed, and that's going to require a collective effort if we're going to adequately address them. 
As regards wildlife trade, as we've heard, CITES is the global legal instrument that regulates international trade. Its decisions are based upon trade and biological criteria. It does not include risk to public health or animal health in its decision making, including in listing a species or in approving any trade transactions. For example, pangolins are listed under CITES. Horseshoe bats, along with many other bat species, are not. CITES trade controls only address overexploitation, namely whether a trade transaction will threaten the survival of that species. And CITES' narrow focus on overexploitation was sound when the convention was negotiated in the early 1970s, but it cannot be sustained in a post COVID 19 world. Today, we need to take a One Health approach to wildlife trade, as Sally's just indicated. At the present time, some states are taking stricter domestic measures to ban certain wildlife trade markets and consumption as a precautionary measure, which is to be welcomed. However, to be effective, such measures will need to be applied and enforced across all countries to stave off future pandemics. And to achieve this objective, we need to work within an open, transparent, science-based international legal framework that includes health criteria in its decision-making process. Now, this does not exist today, either under CITES or anywhere else. And as I see it, there are three options at the international level to build public and animal health into wildlife trade laws. We can amend CITES. We could create a new protocol under the Convention on Biological Diversity, or we could create a new agreement under the World Health Organization. And I've had an opportunity to look at all three options. And in my view, amending CITES will be the fastest, most effective and cost efficient route to take in achieving a One Health approach to regulating wildlife trade. CITES parties have been creative over many years in how they have interpreted the convention. And they have, through their decisions, enabled the convention to evolve quite considerably. And some people have asked me if we can achieve a One Health objective without having to amend the convention text itself. CITES parties could adopt a suite of new or revised resolutions and decisions that address health related issues. They could establish cooperative agreements with relevant agencies and strengthen the implementation of existing agreements in order to move CITES closer towards taking a One Health approach to wildlife trade. And these measures could offer valuable guidance to parties and support enhanced working relationships with relevant agencies at all levels. But there are limits to what uh, such guidance can achieve, and it could not change the core mandate of the Convention. If public and animal health is to become an integral part of the legally binding wildlife trade regime under CITES, then the Convention text will need to be amended, along with certain resolutions, and there is a clear process for doing both. In relation to wildlife crime, and we've heard from Steve and others uh, on this, we've known for some time now that serious wildlife crime is organized, transnational, it's fueled by corruption, has a devastating impact on wildlife, on local communities, national economies, security, public health, and entire ecosystems. But this is now increasingly obvious. Yet remarkably, there is no global legal agreement on wildlife crime. And in the absence of any alternative, we've turned to CITES to crank up the fight against illegal wildlife trade and with some success, as the chair indicated in his remarks. However, CITES was never designed to deal with wildlife crime and its limitations as a trade related rather than a crime related convention in combating serious wildlife crimes are now clearly evident. This is perhaps best illustrated by the fact that record levels of illegal trade in pangolins have been recorded over the past two years, despite them having been given the highest level of protection under CITES back in 2016. The 2019 United Nations IPBS Global Assessment tells us that 1 million species are at risk of extinction over the coming decades if we do not change course. This report and others make it clear that we must look beyond CITES listed species which accounts for only 36,000 or less than 1% of the world's 8 million species. We must use the law to help countries stop the theft of all of their wildlife, 
both plants and animals, terrestrial and marine, and not just those species that are on the brink of extinction. We must finally grasp the nettle with serious wildlife crime and put combating such crimes where it belongs. We must embed it into the international criminal law framework. And this can be done by creating a new protocol to the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, as has been done for other serious crimes, such as human trafficking. Further, with new bans on high risk wildlife markets and the trade in and consumption of certain wildlife on public health grounds, the need for an effective global enforcement response is greater than ever. If not, such markets and trade may simply move underground, which will exacerbate rather than diminish the health risk. And a new wildlife crime protocol could, amongst other matters, embed combating wildlife crime into the criminal justice system, enhance international cooperation across international borders, facilitate the making, the making the best use of the tools available under the UN Convention in combating wildlife crime, extend the global scope of wildlife crime beyond the trafficking of species listed under CITES, provide us with a common definition of wildlife crime and set out what conduct should be criminalized. Finally, I'd like to make a few remarks about protecting wildlife at source. And wherever possible, it is best to take measures to stop the illegal taking, trade and consumption of wildlife before it ever happens by better protecting wildlife at source and its habitat. And when they have a stake in it, local communities are the best protectors of wildlife before it ever enters illegal trade. And in doing so, they are also helping to avert the next wildlife related pandemic. We need to focus our collective efforts around large scale long term commitments to wildlife rich places that are included in protected areas and other effective area based conservation measures and that can deliver multiple benefits. Well, when well managed, these areas provide security for people and wildlife, bring about stability and law and order. They create the conditions needed to attract tourism, secure the carbon, combat poaching, protect biodiversity, and they create decent local jobs in remote areas. And I've seen this for myself across many countries, including in the Gurumba National Park in DRC, which is where I first met David um, last year. Today, we better understand the multiple benefits of nature conservation. Yet these benefits are not sufficiently recognized by health development or security initiatives or their financing. And as the benefits of effective nature conservation extends well beyond wildlife, so too must the sources of financing. Chair, uh, if we manage to take these actions, I believe we will be well placed to avert the next wildlife related pandemic. But if we do not act boldly now to institutionalize the changes that are needed to laws, funding and programs, I fear that we may find ourselves back in the same place in the not too distant future. Thank you very much uh, once again for the invitation to address you and my brief remarks have been supplemented by some reference materials that have been provided for you via our good colleagues at the ICCF. Thank you very much. Thank you. If uh, if the chair would uh, pick up the call, the the honourable and Green Twan Han, if I pronounce this correctly, the floor is yours. Well, th thank you very much, the uh, international panelists, for your presentations. Well, I I, I think. Um, now it's time for the uh, Q&A sessions, but I, I was informed that uh, the General Secretary would say something before we are having the uh, Q&A sessions. Uh, the Secretary General, would you like to say something? Yeah. Yeah, all right. All right, I, I think we lost her. So, uh, shall we uh, move to the Q and A sessions? All right. So, thank you very much again uh, for presentation to the four international specialists.
for the Q&A questions, uh, I uh, strongly believe that in my hands, you know, we have uh, the list of uh, a participants, uh, a member of parliament from uh, eight uh, countries. And uh, also, uh, according to the participant here, we, uh, we have about 36 participants. And uh, I also believe that there are a lot of uh, participants uh, watching this through YouTube. So for the Q&A sessions, I would like to um, suggest that uh, we will give priority uh, to make your questions. Uh, firstly, for the member of parliament uh, from uh, the eight countries. And then if we do have a time, uh, then we uh, we will uh, call you know other uh, uh, guests or the um, the participant who would like to raise the questions. So uh, for the order, uh, can I start with uh, a representative from Brunei? Uh, can I uh, can I have can I call for Brunei? Do you have any questions? And uh, before Thanks. questions, I would like to ask you to uh, introduce your name and also your positions. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, my name is Karunisa, and I'm the member of parliament from Brunei Darussalam. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah, 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 it's quite clear. Yeah, okay. So um, I actually just have one question for uh, Ms. Salia. So you mentioned that um, many countries are reluctant to penalize consumers. Has there been a lot of conversations to encourage countries to review the law to penalize consumers uh, the same way that we tackle the drug market? Hi, thank you for your question. Um, uh, as, I, as, as my observation, yeah. Um, there is, there is a, a, the focus on consumer is mainly on demand reduction uh, from what I'm observing in terms of uh, the, the um, um, momentum and motivation uh, to reduce uh, consumption. Not so much of the law. That has been raised before um, uh, in, in, the, in the handbook, the legal handbook that are produced which is uh, quite outdated. I mean, that's in 2016. Um, consumption was raised as one of the issue that it needs to be uh, part of the provision to penalize consumers. But um, as we can see from um, the laws currently, not many countries, um, uh, and it's not just uh, Southeast Asia or ASEAN, uh, are, are really, um, taking the bull by the horn and, and penalizing consumers. Much of the efforts are on um, demand reduction or social behavioral change communication. Well, uh, I would like to ask other uh, international uh, panelists, is there anyone who would like to answer this question? to share with Sally. All right, so thank you very much, Sally. Uh, and uh, I would like to call for Lao PDR. Can you uh, introduce your name and positions and uh, the question to whom you want to uh, answer? The uh, representative from, from Lao PDR, uh, can you hear me? Okay, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm very happy to able to participate on uh, this video conference. And I feel that uh, this is very important uh, meeting. I would very agree uh, with the presentation made by the panelists. I, uh, one of the presentation made by uh, Miss Sally Young, 
the re recommendation, I would agree with uh, most of them. But one thing that I would like to share uh, with the participants is uh, the, 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 the ensuring the safeguard for the community and traders. I would agree. But I think uh, the most important is we need to support the rural community is how to they be able to uh, irrigate it, you see, from, from, uh, uh, from the poor uh, condition. Because the rural people, they are depending very much on the uh, wildlife and also the medi medicine also. You see, so I think the if we can support the rural area to give them a better life, better condition, and the uh, opportunity for them to find the uh, way of uh, living, I think that it is uh, one of the uh, alternative way to uh, encourage people to have uh, a better life and not to live on the wildlife. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, can I call for Indonesia? I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to join this uh, webinar this morning in Indonesia, it's uh, nine o'clock uh, in the morning. Uh, I'd like to ask to all the panelists, uh, first of all, before we go to more technical things, uh, I'd like to be in one clear voice, uh, both statement for all the panelists, what we should do, because uh, in terms of this wildlife trade, there's a different solution from uh, every challenge. So first of all, I'd like to uh, know in the ground base, first, should we fight all of these illegal trades or we only fight these irregularities? Since these irregularities means that uh, there's some survey said that the 40% of the wildlife trade, it's a uh, die in the transport or miss, uh, uh, before they come to the buyer, or we should just deregulate this under the database of the uh, CITES. Uh, there's some of the uh, various variety that will be preserved, and uh, which one that can be traded, and which one is cannot uh, be traded. So. Uh, what's the best approach uh, in terms to reduce the exposure of the uh, potential of the next pandemic? This is we have to do fight all of this or just fight the uh, some items of this uh, wildlife threat or just regulate this like uh, Mr. John Scanlon uh, ever mentioned uh, earlier. Thank you. Uh -huh. Can I, uh, the, uh, the uh, participant from Indonesia uh, raised the question for the four panelists. So uh, can I ask uh, the panelist, uh, Mr. John Stalin, uh, to start first? Do you thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you uh, to Indonesia for, for the question. Yes, we have a... COVID-19 pandemic has identified some gaps in our system. And I think the, one of the biggest gaps is that the wildlife trade regime established under CITES does not address public health issues or animal health issues. So determining whether a, a species should be regulated under CITES is looking at trade and biological criteria, but not at criteria that are relevant to public or animal health. So. For example, horseshoe bats, which David has told us is the most likely source uh, of COVID-19, 
is not regulated under CITES because it didn't meet the criteria and yet international trade in that and consumption ought be regulated because of the public health risk. So we really need to expand that brief. So that's why I've suggested we ought to look at amending CITES so that we can broaden its scope, not just look at overexploitation, but look at wider public and animal health issues in terms of what trade is regulated, whether trade should be authorized or not. So this one health approach. The other challenge we have though, and this was highlighted by others, including Sally, is that we're only regulating around 36,000 uh, species, trade in 36,000 species. There's 8 million species on the planet. And the UN IPBS report tells us a million of them are at risk of extinction. At the moment, we take an almost like an emergency ward approach to conservation. We wait until an animal or plant has almost gone extinct before we pay attention to it through the international system. We really need to broaden our scope here. And we ought not have a system that tolerates the theft of any wildlife from any country, whether the species is endangered or not. So we need to widen our scope, widen our approach to wildlife crime to cover all wildlife marine, you know, fish, as well as uh, terrestrial animals and plants. So I think we really need to make changes there to the international system because COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has really shown some significant gaps in our system that, that leave us vulnerable. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, how about other international uh, panelists? Sally Yang, do you have any uh, answer for that, that question? Um, well, well, to me, uh, it should be all. But I think, uh, more practically speaking, um, I have I have talked about um, uh, species that are of particular uh, at, at high risk species, uh, which David has mentioned. You know, species like uh, primates and uh, rodents, uh, and probably some uh, avian uh, species. Um, um, they, they all need to be on the priority list uh, to assess whether they are or they are not uh, 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 species that needs to be included in a particular list where there should not be any trade at all. Now, I'm not saying that the um, uh, member states should stop there, um, but that will be a very good start. I think Steve wants to say something too. All right, so go, go ahead. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to address the last two questions together and build on what John and Sally just said. First, um, with regard to the very good question from our distinguished representative from uh, Lao PDR, um, we definitely can do take the right decision and still be very sensitive to and supportive of the rural poor. Uh, I don't think these issues are mutually exclusive. Studies have been conducted, some by the World Bank, others by NGOs. They all come to the same conclusion, which is that the wildlife trade, the commercial wildlife trade is driven by wealth. It's not driven by poverty. Um, we also can see that uh, the coronavirus 19 has discriminated largely against the poor. It has impacted poor people more than the wealthy. So we need to take that into consideration. And thirdly, as I said in my presentation, I think there is a way to uh, transition uh, people out of the legal trade into a different vocation. The world is spending an awful lot of money right now uh, with uh, stimulus recovery checks and programs. It would just take a tiny percentage of that to uh, first focus on nature protection and secondly on make, helping people get out of uh, the business of commercial wildlife trade. Having said all that, a ban on commercial trade in wild animals would not ban subsistence hunting. Those are two completely different things. And I will finally just say, I think, you know, I, I, I think a decision has to be made here um, if we are going to protect the interests of the people and economy and environment of ASEAN you know, there's a very, very small percentage of people in the world, including in ASEAN, who actually benefit from wildlife trade. It is less than 1%. And a lot of those people 
are criminals. Those who are making uh, a legal living and those at the world level, like I said, they can be helped, transitioned and compensated and a ban does not need to touch on subsistence hunting. But we have to remember what happened in China, which has happened before and can easily happen again, was basically a light nuclear bomb. We've got ticking time bombs across Southeast Asia and I think they need to be extinguished. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think uh, our time is uh, running out. So uh, we, we still have a lot of uh, questions from other country. So can I move to uh, the next uh, country, which is uh, Malaysia? Uh, can I call for the uh, member of parliament uh, from Malaysia? Please raise the questions. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate and to listen to this excellent presentation. Uh, I've got two questions. The first question is for Mr. David Kwaman. Uh, my question is, do we allow people to, domesti uh, to domesticate uh, wild animals? Do we allow or, do, don't, uh, or should we allow or shouldn't we allow? Uh, in my country, for example, there are people who uh, try to domesticate porcupine and uh, domesticating wild birds is very popular. What do you think of that? That's uh, the uh, first question. Uh, the second question is uh, for uh, Ms. Sally. Uh, and that is about the forensics of wildlife, uh, wildlife uh, trading, prosecution, uh, et cetera. Do we have good experts, good resources, uh, good data uh, to uh, database uh, that will be helpful in prosecuting, uh, uh, in cases in, 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 uh, to, to prosecute these uh, this, uh, traffickers in court. Thank you very much. I am Azman, anyway, from the uh, Malaysian Parliament. Azman Ismail. Yeah, the uh, representative from uh, Malaysia have two questions. And uh, one is for Demit Kwaman, and uh, the other one is for Sally. Uh, can I call for Mr. David? Yes. yes, thank you very much, uh, um, Member Osman, for that, uh, for that question, and it's a good question. Um, it's one I've thought about, too. Um, when I visited China while researching my book, Spillover, uh, I visited, among other things, a bamboo rat farm. And as I'm, you probably know, bamboo rat is a wild animal that is raised um, in domestic circumstances for the food trade in China. Uh, the farm that I visited, um, the man who ran it was taking precautions to keep his animals free of at least bacterial diseases insofar as he was possible. He was, um, he was giving them antibiotics. Uh, viral diseases, I don't know. Um, he also had porcupines in his farm there. These were going to market as live wild animals raised domestically to markets in China. Um, should we ban that? Um, I think what is necessary at very least is for operations like that to be very carefully regulated for hygiene and inspection against the problem of diseases, not just bacterial diseases, but viral pathogens as well. If that is done, then I think there is an argument for that. Um, I'm still undecided myself as to which side of that argument I come down on, but I would say that at very least, if there is domestic um, husbandry of uh, wild animal species for market to be shipped live to market, then there has to be very careful government regulation of the hygienic condition of those animals in terms of viruses and bacteria. Yeah, thank you, uh, David Common. And uh, now is uh, Sally Zan. Do you have some answer? Yes. Um, in fact, uh, this is something that Steve could probably uh, talk to as well. Um, but what I'd like to say is regarding forensics um, uh, capabilities, in fact, um, Malaysia is designated to be one of the regional center of excellence for forensics. Uh, evidence and and Thailand. I know that Thailand has a very good forensics lab as well for wildlife specifically. 
um, training is ongoing. Ideally, if we have a regional center uh, and, and building up national capacity, uh, that, that, that will be excellent. Uh, uh, um, uh, Steve, would you like to add anything to that? No, I think you answered that adequately and I'll make space for other questions. Thanks, Sally. Thank you very much, Sally. And um, shall we move to Malay? Uh, shall we move to uh, Myanmar? Uh, can I call for a representative from Myanmar? Hello. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, no. Minglawa. I'm Dr. Daonsu, member of parliament. Myanmar, as well as I'm a veterinarian. So I have a question for David Kwemen. I would like about the mutation of virus. COVID-19 is not severe in dog and cat. It is very dangerous as a result, but they are very close to human. One approach need to promote to enforce to cooperate and collaborate, wildlife, human health, and animal health on all sectors. That's why it is not only wildlife trade, but also pets animals and livestock animals for the future pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for the question. Thank you for the question, member. Um, you're absolutely right that there is an issue, not just with wildlife uh, in terms of potential reservoirs for coronaviruses in general and SARS-CoV-2, this coronavirus in particular. As a matter of fact, uh, I just read a newly posted scientific article today from a number of scientists in China. The senior author is uh, Shun Xu. Um, it's entitled, well, it's got a long complicated title, but essentially it's about um, the way that SARS, this SARS coronavirus um, can target the cells in pets, livestock, poultry, as well as wildlife. And it talks about the fact that the cell receptors that can be found in the respiratory tract, and I believe it's in the kidneys and the spleens of some kinds of domestic animals are susceptible to penetration by this particular virus, and therefore those animals can be infected. Dogs are not very susceptible. They do not have the right kind of cells uh, with uh, receptors on their surfaces for this virus to target them. But cats, yes. Cats, yes. Um, pigs, yes. And as we've seen from a couple of cases recently in the Netherlands, mink, mink that are farmed for their fur in the Netherlands have been found to be infected with, um, with the new coronavirus and thousands of mink have been killed, have been culled in order to protect people of the Netherlands from infection from these mink, although the mink seem to have gotten the virus from the people who take care of them. So yes, you're absolutely right. There is a potential um, passage, not just from animals, non-human animals into humans, but from humans into non-human animals, including some of our domestic animals, even our pets like cats. And if you have a pig for a pet, I think it could go into your pet pig. Uh, in any case, this is a concern um, that, um, that is very serious and uh, is in the process of being addressed. Yeah, th thank you very much. And I, uh, I hope the uh, answer will fit the uh, questions uh, from, Malay, uh, from Myanmar. So can we move to uh, uh, Philippines? Can I call for the uh, MP from the Philippines? Uh, do we have a member of parliament from the Telephines on the Philippines on the call? Here, here we go. Still, we haven't. We, haven't. we may uh, have to move on so, to. Yeah, we may have to move to other countries and we will return to uh, the uh, representative from the Philippines later. 
So can I call for Thailand, uh, the member of parliament from Thailand, please? Hello. Can anyone hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about. I'm sorry about that. I, my my name is Lily Pon I am a, an MP from Thailand. Yes, I am sorry about uh about this morning. I I came late for the meeting because I just I just was I I was on the train. So I have just really small question, Jet, about uh the COVID nineteen. And we all know that uh, the COVID nineteen is come from the coronavirus. And for my research, I know that uh, the coronavirus is really close to people because it is with uh, the wild of animal and also eat our pet. We have known that for about 80 years. And what I am interested about the education and do we, I mean, should we have any uh, give some knowledge or educate people that we it's time to pay attention more for the animal welfare. I mean, if we are look after the the animal well, some virus will not come to, to the people. Yeah, my, my point is should we rise up the, the issue that we should pay more attention and give more information into I mean to our child, into a school, into university. And uh, do we have any any regulation or or plan to 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 educate people in 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 our country? I mean, in in most of our party party participants uh, countries. Yes, is my question. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, the international panelists. Yeah, David Kramer. Yeah. I would I would uh, say something, and then and then John has something to say. Um, I absolutely think that the more education um, that we can get to our 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 children, our young children in the schools about about science, um, about biology, uh, about our relationship with other animals, reminding them of the fact that we ourselves are animals. We are we are mammals. Um, the more they understand our connectedness with the rest of the natural world, the better we will be. That doesn't mean we're gonna try and turn everybody into vegetarians. That's a complicated issue too. It does mean that uh, we might think twice about um, industrial scale factory farming, factory husbandry of uh, domestic animals. I mean, I jokingly said that if one had um, a pig for a pet um, as well as a cat, you might get coronavirus from it. But um, but in fact, uh, pigs that are raised in um, industrial scale operations have been a conduit for emerging viruses in past cases, including the case of Nipah virus in Northern Malaysia. And uh, Malaysia took steps to change the way in which um, uh, pigs are husbanded in that area. And it has reduced their risk of further spillovers of Nipah virus, a very salubrious step that they have taken. Um, so both in terms of uh, the way industrial scale husbandry of domestic animals is done and the way our young people are educated, I think we need to remember that we are animals, we are connected to other animals, um, they are our relatives and should be treated, even when they're destined for food, they should be treated with a degree of respect. Yeah, thank you very much. I also uh, got the uh, request to answer from other international panelists. Yeah. John uh, Cashin. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the question. And um, yes, just um, agree with what was underlying the question, what David said. What uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has shown us is how interconnected everything is. Our environment, animal and human health and our economies and we really have to rethink our relationship with nature. We have to take pause and say we are 
over exploiting nature, whether it be clearing of native vegetation or the way in which we're exploiting wildlife, whether it's regulated under CITES or not. And we have an extraordinary report last year from the UN, the IPBS Global Assessment. It tells us if we keep going the way we are, we're going to lose 1 million out of the 8 million species. They'll go extinct. So we've really had a wake up call in a very devastating way. We have to rethink the way we are interacting with nature and we can use this opportunity to educate our kids the way you've said and David has said that we're all part of this uh, wonderful world of ours. We're connected with nature. We can't isolate ourselves from us. Uh, we've just been reminded of that in a devastating way. So let's rethink it. Let's get our kids on board. Let's understand nature, our interrelationship with nature, how we treat wildlife, how we grow our food, how we treat uh, animals in that process. So, you know, it's been devastating for every country, for so many people, but let's see if we can come out of this in much better shape uh, and with a much better sense of how we are part of this world. All right, thank you very much. Then uh, I would like to return to uh, the Philippines. Do we have the, uh, the representative from the Philippines here? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, my colleague in the Philippines, uh, our chairperson and committee on ecology, Representative Bilpijo Barsaga has some manifestation and questions. Uh, but he's trying to communicate through his uh, phone, but cannot uh, unmute his uh, phone. Therefore, I would like to throw the question of, uh, my, of, our, of my colleague, Representative uh, L.P. Jobarsaga, Jr. The question is, what do you think is the most severe and effective penalty which ASEAN countries can impose in their jurisdiction in order to deter illegal wildlife trade? It is a good stance that penalties be uniform among nations especially the ASEAN nations, and the acts punish should include import, export, possession, sale, and consumption. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, mentions uh, who you would like to ask. So uh, can I ask again, uh, you know, for which uh, international panelists you want to ask the questions? <clears throat> uh, can we uh, can we ask uh, Mr. Sa um, Ms. Saliang or uh, Mr. Stephen Goster? All right. So uh, he would like to ask Sally. Uh, do you have any answer for him, Sally? Yeah, uh, I'll I'll speak to it, and then I'm sure uh, Steve will be able to add on to what I have to say. Um, in, in terms of the punishment, I think uh, what is key and first and foremost, punishment, the punishment must fit the crime. So there is no one punishment or penalty that will be adequate um, and, and we should reserve the most severe punishment uh, or penalties for the serious perpetrators, the organized syndicate, the kimpins, the middlemen engaging in uh, uh, illegal wildlife trade not the village poacher who is trying to feed his family. Um, so in terms of what are the kind of um, uh, penalties that can be uh, imposed, um, first of all, you know, having a minimum fine. Uh, at the moment, uh, most of it, I'm not saying all of the ASEAN member states, uh, there are some that has a minimum fine, um, uh, which will then... Um, um, ensure that the judge will not let them go free without any fine, okay? Um, and then you have, um, if you have mandatory imprisonment term, now that will be a very good uh, deterrent as well. Uh, at the moment, most of the laws in ASEAN member states um, says fine and or a certain amount of imprisonment term, which means it could be from zero to whatever, yeah? Um, but if you impose a minimum, uh, uh, i.e. a mandatory uh, imprisonment term for the more serious offenses, 
then of course uh, that will be more of a deterrent. Um, things like making separate law, uh, separate provisions uh, for uh, or aggravated penalties for organized criminals, uh, illegal wildlife trade that has been uh, committed through organized uh, syndicate. That's one way of doing it as well. Um, ensuring that uh, accomplices, aiding and abetting accomplices, uh, has the same penalty as the primary offender is also very useful in the case of uh, organized crime because a lot of times the kingpin are not the ones being uh, uh, app apprehended at the, at the scene. So, so at, at the end, it's so difficult to actually get them because they are not there. So they, they are not caught red-handed and it's the poor guy who's doing the running that ends up in jail and being charged. So um, just to close this off, right, what's important then uh, after saying all this is that there should be uh, wildlife sentencing guidelines. Uh, I think that will help the judges a lot because judges uh, um, may not necessarily see wildlife crime as a serious crime. They may not make the distinction between the poachers in, in the village uh, uh, and the syndicate. Um, Steve? Yeah, thanks, Sally. Just to add real shortly, um, I think the most impactful and simplest way to respond to wildlife crime is to find out where the money is. The wildlife traffickers, the ones who are driving the poaching, who are financing it, and are putting all of us in danger by feeding these markets, they're making money. They've built houses with these money. They've got cars, planes, hotels whatever, they've got cash in the bank. We talk about the wildlife trade being billions of dollars. A large percentage of that is owned by people in this region. So I think the way to stop them is to freeze and seize their assets. And we have an opportunity, I think in the Philippines, you've got legislation, a few other countries also in the region do, to allow for, to uh, convert those assets into restitution. So you could take that money from wildlife traffickers and put together a nature protection or wildlife recovery fund. I think that is what we would recommend is the simplest and most effective punishment that would serve everyone's interest rather than just putting somebody behind bars. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I still see uh... Don uh, Scallon would like to answer the question, so please go. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you for the question. Um, wildlife crime, including illegal wildlife trade, is a, is a global issue. Um, it affects every region in one way or another as a source country, a transit country, or a destination country, and it requires international cooperation right across the illegal supply chain. At the moment, we have no common legal framework that we're operating within. Yet we do have a UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. It has three protocols outlining three serious crimes. We need to embed wildlife crime into this international criminal law framework through a new protocol on wildlife crime. Through that, we can have a common global definition of wildlife crime, what we all agree we can agree what particular conduct should be criminalized at the national level. We can make sure that we use all of the tools that are available under this UN convention for cross-border cooperation. And we can expand our scope. We have to look beyond the 36,000 species of CITES and look at all wildlife crime, whether that is an endangered species or not, because local communities, national economies are being, um, um, pillaged by this crime, whether it's affecting um, CITES listed species or not. We have a wonderful opportunity there to embed this in the international framework. Really now is the time to do it because if you look at illegal trade, Steve mentioned $20 billion, that's CITES listed species. It's up to $200 billion a year, according to the World Bank, if you look at all wildlife, all plants and animals that find their way into illegal trade. So we really need to treat this as a serious crime as we have other serious crimes and enhance that global cooperation to bring it to an end. 
Thank you, John. Uh, we just want to uh, ask that we limit ourselves to a single response because we do want to make sure that every single elected official has the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, still, uh, we have a last uh, country that is uh, Vietnam. And uh, I would like to call for uh, Mr. Don Tuấn Phong, a standing member of Foreign Affairs to raise the question. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you. But, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the panelists for the very informative uh, presentations. And I would uh, like to thank ICCF and IPA uh, for this uh, initiative. It's a very interesting topic, a very hot topic. Uh, my question is to every of the panelists, anyone would like to answer, that is uh, with regard to uh, policy implications, as we see uh, fairly clearly the, the problems right now. Uh, John has mentioned somehow what we should do uh, uh, jointly, uh, cooperative effort. But obviously, the question of illegal wildlife trade is, uh, could be seen at the local, uh, national, regional, and uh, international levels. So therefore, we probably need a set of tools and policies at different levels. Would you specify what uh, parliaments, especially uh, parliaments of uh, ASEAN, could do, at least to uh, contribute to the ongoing efforts and I totally agree that we uh, need international efforts, uh, as some countries have uh, been able to criminalize uh, illegal uh, wildlife trade already. But some countries uh, probably do not uh, as yet uh, enforce uh, strong measures against it. So my question is very much on the policy aspects. Uh, for the parliaments of different countries. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fong. And uh, this question is for the four international panelists. So uh, I would like to call, you know, for any uh, international panelists who want to uh, answer first. Okay, Steve, please. Okay. Thank you for the very good and important question. I think uh, the policy at this point should be to eliminate the chance of another zoonotic outbreak happening in any one ASEAN country. And the way to eliminate that possibility, to mitigate that possibility, and certainly severity, is to eliminate the commercial trade in wild animals. I know that that's a difficult thing to do in some countries because there are people, there's an interest in maintaining the legal trade by certain sectors. But again, if we weigh the price that this zoonotic outbreak just had on the world and each country versus how much money is being made by a very small percentage of people, and there's a way to compensate them, then I think it weighs in favor of doing the safest thing, which is to ban commercial trade in wild animals. At the very least, making it a national security issue, not just a wildlife or environmental issue, it, at the very least, put a moratorium on it while you study it. That's my recommendation, thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, John Stalin. Thank you very much um, for the question and um, um, for highlighting the importance of local, national, regional, and, and global cooperation. We have to operate at all levels. I think here on the wildlife trade side, the policy um, uh, choice ought be to take a one health approach to wildlife trade because at the moment we keep separating public health, animal health, 
and over exploitation. And by doing that, we're getting ourselves into some trouble. We need to have that converge and take a one health approach to wildlife trade. So we make fully informed decisions based on the sort of good science David has shared with us this evening. You know, where is the risk? How do we make sure that we are mitigating that risk? And we can only do that with a fully informed decision with all of this information uh, that is available. Uh, the other thing is there is a very good toolkit that the UN Office of Drugs and Crime have done, which is a more generic toolkit about um, uh, dealing with wildlife crime um, right through the, through the system. And they've used this toolkit in many countries. So that, that's a useful um, uh, toolkit for, uh, for making policy. But if I just had one message, it would be one health approach to wildlife trade. Thank you very much. Well, uh, how about Steve? Do you have anything uh, for Vietnam representative? Um, can I just say something? This is Sally. All right, sure, sure. Yes. Um, what can parliaments do? On a national level, call for oversights on wildlife laws and other relevant laws that deals with pandemic. Um, following what John says, you know, look at it from a One Health perspective and approach. Push for budgets for law enforcers. Steve mentioned about budgets uh, and, and proceeds of crime. Very often, law enforcers are, are not well funded to do their job. So, and at IPA, continue to pass resolutions and discuss matters on wildlife trafficking because it has to be on the table all the time in order to get the momentum. Thank you. We would like to uh, go to the second round by, you know, calling the, uh, uh, the representative from Thailand. Uh, you register. Good morning, IPA members, ICCF and all panelists. I'm General Sulasa, Chair of Senior Conservation Caucus Thailand. I'm pleased to join this important event to cope with the COVID-19 in ASEAN and worldwide. We are not denied that wildlife is the lost cause of pandemic. Therefore, ASEAN had to work together to prevent illegal wildlife trafficking with support by international organizations especially ICCF and so on. Last year, I had an opportunity to chair the special ASEAN meeting on illegal wildlife trafficking. I think it was the important step to continue in ASEAN. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you forgot to uh, name the panel who you want to answer. So uh, do you have any specific yeah. panelists? Yeah, I think uh, we lost him. So uh, for the international uh, panelist, to his questions, the representative from Thailand, uh, who would like to uh, answer these questions? Well, maybe just very briefly, um, I, I, I saw it more as a statement, but I would like to reinforce what our, our distinguished colleague from Thailand said, which is last March, there was an ASEAN meeting on developing a, uh, an action plan for counter wildlife trafficking in the region. The ministers of all 10 countries got together and it's a, a plan that's in motion. And the plan does recognize that there are wildlife markets across the region that, that, can, um, uh, that, that can present a, a danger to public health being high risk markets. So I think that that's important to know that the policymakers do not need to start from scratch. There's already a minister led action plan in motion. That was before COVID. I would recommend that they strengthen that action plan. And as we said, uh, strongly consider 
uh, closing all the markets, at least until they study the problem more to mitigate the risk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Steve. How about Sally Yang? Do you have any answer for him? I, um, I agree with uh, uh, General Surasat. Um, and, and yes, um, the Chiang Mai statement, which I mentioned in my presentation earlier, did mention about the closing of um, domestic wildlife markets. Um, the, the only thing that was missing was um, um, uh, a discussion about um, pandemics, the health aspects again. And that's why my recommendation was that in the next iteration of the ministerial declaration, and hopefully uh, the next uh, member state will host that, who chair, um, who chair uh, uh, the, the ASEAN chairmanship, will host the next, the second special ministerial meeting on illegal wildlife trade, and perhaps add the sentence to close domestic wildlife markets to prevent the next transmission of uh, COVID or pandemic. All right, so thank you very much. Still, we, we have, uh, you know, one more question uh, from Indonesia. So can I call, you know, representative from uh, Indonesia? Yes, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. So distinguished parliamentarians, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you IPA, Madam Secretary, and also ICCF for hosting a very relevant um, an important discussion. Uh, firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is Diaroro Esti. I'm an MP from Indonesia, currently a member of Commission 7, which basically oversees the energy on, and also research and technology sectors. I'm also a member of the Oceans Caucus, which works alongside with ICCF and Secretary of the Green Economy Caucus at the Indonesian Parliament, uh, given you know, my passion really just for the sustainability field. Um, just really quickly, I wanted to echo what was mentioned by Honorable uh, MP from Laos. Um, and I think with this regard, we have to take time and think about why you know, wildlife uh, exists in the market in the first place. And for the most part, it has a lot to do with economical means, um, whether it be you know, feeding their family and, and their uh, kids at, at homes, in their respective homes. And so, the most important thing I feel is to continuously spread awareness, which is what we're doing now uh, with this discussion. And also um, given our uh, respective uh, fields, whether it be, you know, as a policymaker, as an activist, as an academia, as a CSO, you know, um, and, and really just collect, uh, collectively work together in, in solving this issue. And so thank you for outlining a couple of uh, conventions or legislations that are already in place. And I think that will essentially, um, you know, feed information for parliamentarians uh, in today's discussion for us to be able to implement in our respective countries. Uh, and lastly, uh, really just my question has to do, uh, has a lot more to do with the impact of the pandemic on waste management as a, as a whole. So I wanted to give you guys an update with what's happening in Indonesia. We've seen that protective gear such as masks, uh, medical suits, face shields, they've been floating in our rivers and our oceans. And this tremendously impacts uh, marine ecosystems, uh, animals, and also it will eventually travel its way up onto the food chains, so affecting uh, humans overall. Right, and so how can we solve this collectively to stop further spread of the coronavirus? And there's also been an increase in uh, plastic waste. Uh, there has been an increase of 30% in Indonesia alone, uh, as more people tend to use plastic uh, bottles as opposed to glass or bringing their own tumblers. You know, we've actually stopped single-use uh, plastic bottles in the Indonesian parliament uh, for several months now. However, due to the virus, plastic bottles have resurfaced. Um, you know, uh, parliamentarians prefer the plastic bottles given that it's safely sealed. And so how, my question really is, you know, how can we combat climate change while also combating uh, the global pandemic that we are faced with today? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the international panelists. Okay, John uh, Scallon, please. Thank you very much for that uh, really excellent input and, and reminding us of multiple consequences of uh, this pandemic. 
And one of the issues that's been raised is, you know, it's the way in which we interact with nature. And I think David highlighted this, where clearing more and more um, native forest, uh, native vegetation, and it's this interaction with wildlife um, that is, is causing problem and leading to next pandemics. We need to better protect wildlife at source, better protect habitat. Now, the beauty of that is if we do it well, we can prevent the next pandemics, we protect biodiversity, but we're also combating climate change because you're securing the carbon in these forests and um, other areas. So we do have an opportunity here to start connecting a whole lot of issues that we've tended to put into separate silos, but they all converge. If you well protect uh, nature, there are multiple benefits, as you well know, through everything you've done, biodiversity, climate change, uh, generating jobs, protecting watersheds, but we're just failing to connect that. And we're also not financing these issues in a way that recognizes the multiple benefits. We tend to look at a small conservation budget where it's its health budgets, security budgets, development budgets that really need to converge to protect these places. Then we get multiple benefits. We're dealing with climate change, preventing pandemics, protecting biodiversity. So we really have an opportunity to change the way in which we, we view nature and the way we invest in nature now. Yeah, thank you, Jean. Uh, uh, any uh, others uh, answer from uh, our international panelists? Okay, Stephen. Yeah, I think it's an excellent question from our distinguished colleague from Indonesia. Um, I think the One Health approach has the, the beautiful benefit of mitigating climate change. If it's implemented the right way to take care of people, sustain agriculture, and protect nature at the same time, uh, then we've addressed the poverty, we've provided uh, food in a sustainable, compassionate way, and we're also mitigating climate change. So I think um, the One Health approach, and also in terms of financing, support for rural poor who may be currently involved in collecting wildlife for commercial traders. I think there's different ways of doing that. One is to shift government budgets more into nature protection, which should include local livelihoods. Um, we really need to invest in nature protection like it's our national, regional, and global insurance policy. I think we're where we're at because we didn't pay our premium. <laughs> so to speak. But also remember there, there's money in the hands of the people who illegally destroyed nature. There's a lot of money. John just mentioned 10 times more the amount that I talked about. If we can just even get a small percentage of that back into government hands to distribute to the rural poor, nature protection recovery, and we've taken care of that problem. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, about other international panelists, do you have any uh, uh, comments or an answer for this? I guess I would, uh, well, deferring to my colleagues on um, these matters of, uh, of, of international policy in terms of uh, climate change and the threat of pandemic disease and the loss of biological diversity, I see those as the three great problems, the three huge problems that we face on planet Earth. And I suppose you could add taking responsibility for our own <laughs> waste of all sorts, our own, not just consumption, but our waste would be a fourth. And uh, I think of those as uh, three or four parallel rivers that run off the same melting snowfield on a great mountain. They don't cause one another, but they are caused by the same ultimate factors, and those are numbers of human population and the rate of human consumption and the disparity of consumption between the rich and the poor. And so we need to deal with um, those basic problems in order to solve these three huge but still uh, more particularized problems, climate change, loss of biological diversity, and the threat of pandemic disease. Well, uh, thank you very much. We uh, still we have a time uh, for one more uh, questions, and I would like to I would like to ask 
the uh, among the members of parliaments from eight countries is there any uh, country would like to have the questions the last questions All right, I, I think uh, uh, that that would be, uh, I mean, there will be no any questions. So uh, before ending this uh, meeting, I uh, would like to, um, I would like to mention that uh, we, uh, we have received a lot of questions. And I believe that uh, through YouTube, uh, and other channels still lots of questions remaining. So um, we would like to take these questions. Uh, the secretary and should take these questions to the uh, concerns uh, panelists and uh, we'll return with the answer. Uh, distinguished parliamentarians, uh, colleagues and friends, over the past two hours, uh, we have all listened to four presentations from uh, four international panelists and observed an excellent presentations. Uh, the uh, presentation is about animal infections and the next human pandemics and wildlife trade and uh, Asian response, as well as a policy framework we have also received 14 questions for the first round and the second round and the active discussion from member of parliaments uh, <clears throat> and also the international panelists. And um, I believe two hour of meeting is not enough for us to discuss through all aspects of the issue. And the remaining question will be, uh, as I mentioned, collected to send to corresponding panelists. Let me once again like to express my most uh, appreciation and sincere thanks to all participants for your attendance and the IPA Secretary and the ICCF for your hard work in organizing this event. Uh, without your active preparations and uh, participations, uh, I believe that this virtual meeting would not have been successful. I hope that this meeting has uh, provided useful information for the parliamentarians in their work and uh, encourage them to engage more in the fight of, against uh, illegal white trade trafficking and uh, to prevent future pandemics. Uh, this will also help to restore social economic activity in the Asian country after COVID-19. With this, I would like to end this meeting and thank you very much again for your participations. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to say uh, well, some words uh, before we close the webinar. Uh, distinguished parliamentarians, uh, dear colleagues and friends, um, so as you see that uh, uh, within more than two hours, uh, all of us have really enjoyed a uh, very excellent presentation from our four speakers, as well as the Q&A session with many questions uh, from our distinguished parliamentarians. Um, I think that the webinar is uh, wonderful uh, with many questions from parliamentarians. They show us that they are very interested in this very important topic. Uh, of our time now, uh, and I know that there are um, still a lot of questions coming from the participant and audience uh, who, uh, who, who who join our webinars uh, live stream uh, on YouTube. But due to the time constraint, um, uh, we will you know that uh, collect and convey uh, all these questions to our pan panelists after the webinar. So once again, I'd like to especially thanks all members of the uh, parliaments for your time and for your active uh, contribution. Um, I thank all the panelists, um, uh, Mr. John Scallon, Steve Gunster, um, David Quaman, and Sally for your excellent presentation.
And um, finally, I also would like to share with the chair to thank um, the ICCF uh, and the technical team uh, who for your uh, hard work and very close cooperation with the IFA Secretariat uh, during the last few days to um, prepare for this uh, webinar. So before I close the webinar, I would like to wish you all, uh, wish you good health and success in your work and stay strong and um, safe. Uh, I hope to see you all again in the IPA future meetings. Thank you. Bye now.